Hello, ghouls and ghosts, and I'm so sorry, that's the wrong video. Hello, one and all, and welcome to Conspiracism. A treat for you this episode, I present to you an interview with a man betwixt doctor and associate professor, one Patrick Stokes of Deakin University, Melbourne. Pat is both a friend and a colleague. He's a conspiracy theory theorist who appears in my new edited volume, Taking Conspiracy Theory Seriously, and I would hold up a copy, but, well, my complimentary copies have yet to land in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Over the next 15 minutes, Pat and I will discuss a variety of topics, from what conspiracy theories are, the anti-vax conspiracy theories of Australia, and the proper nationality of one Russell Crowe. We also get to grips with Pat's thesis of reluctant particularism, a philosophical approach to the treatment of conspiracy theories which mixes both epistemic duties with moral obligations. Oh, and due to what can only be called teething issues, you won't be seeing much of my fair face in this video, unless you hang around to the end. Hello and welcome, and this week we are talking with Dr. soon-to-be Associate Professor Patrick Stokes from Deakin University in the exotic town of Melbourne, Australia. Hello Pat, how are things? Exotic indeed. It is a strange and curious place. Yes, Australia is, particularly for those of us from Aotearoa, New Zealand, a weird place when it comes to politics in particular, but also mm -hmm. the fact that we keep all of our dangerous animals in the Southern Hemisphere in your backyard rather than ours. This is true, and I'd thank you not to speak of Russell Crowe like that again. We, are we Do we really want to get into yeah. who owns Russell Crowe? Because that's, <laughs> that is a huge issue in our particular system, yeah. because we want you to have him. We really, really yeah, yeah, do no, want you to have him. Yeah. No, well, we do, when he's winning Oscars, he's Australian actor Russell Crowe, and when he's, uh, you know, throwing phones at people or whatever, he's, uh, you know, controversial virtual Kiwi actor Russell Crowe. So it's, uh... And when, when he's performing in his band, what do you yeah. say about him then? <laughs> I, I mean, the least the better, I'm assuming. I wouldn't wish that on New Zealand, to be honest. I wouldn't. Uh, I, no one should take ownership of that. No, it's true. It's true. Sometimes, sometimes it's 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 just best to ignore issues like he Russell Crowe. Well. well, he means well. Does he though? Does he? Well, possibly. <laughs> yeah, well, but we're not here to talk about Russell Crowe and Academy Awards. Oh, oh. We're, <laughs> yes, I know. This is a that's the other podcast. I've been there right? under false pretenses. Uh, we're here to talk about conspiracies and conspiracy theories, and you happen to be one of the many, many conspiracy theory theorists in Australia. And that Australia seems to actually have quite a number of philosophers interested in conspiracy mm -hmm. theories and social scientists interested in conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. So let's start with a really, really basic question. Do conspiracies occur? Yes, obviously. No question about that. Um, obviously, there are explanations of events that clearly are the result of, of actors conspiring in secret to bring about uh, an outcome. No question of that whatsoever. Okay, then. So what's a conspiracy theory? So this is where it gets complicated, right? Because uh, epistemologists, such as your good self, have tend to go for um, a very formal definition of what that means, namely just explaining what a conspiracy theory is purely in terms of um, the formal type of explanation it is, right? The terms I've just used then, right? Um, uh, the, uh, an explanation of observed events in terms of two or more actors working in secret to bring about an outcome, not necessarily the outcome that, that occurred. But I do think there is an important slippage between that very narrow sense of conspiracy theory and the way in which the term is used in different contexts, one of which is, and here I'll give you, you know, David Cody's right and I think you're right and Charles Pigden's right, that there is a, a particular term of conspiracy theory that's purely a term of abuse that doesn't do any great work. But there is also, I think, a recognisable set of social explanatory practices, if you like, um, which is what I think most of us probably mean when we talk about conspiracy theories in general. So when we, as, as an earlier generation of philosophers would have put it, when we speak to the vulgar um, and they use the term conspiracy theory, it's going to be uh, something more like that kind of social term of a recognisable 
um, tradition or practice or family of explanatory practices. And that, I think, is where we do run into um, some things that should worry us. So um, it, I think in some ways, and perhaps unusually for philosophers, epistemologists have more or less won the battle if we define um, conspiracy theory in a very, very narrow sort of way. But then there are some of us who want to then say, okay, well, actually probably just me, who want to say, okay, but then what about the uh, ethical and um, epistemological dimensions of conspiracy theory as a recognisable form of social practice? Uh, I mean, you can use this analogy here, actually, the way that scientists use the word theory versus the way that um, uh, everyday people use the word theory. Uh, which drives scientists mad when they hear um, ordinary people say theory, like, oh, that's just a theory. And scientists say, do you have any idea what that means? And it's like, well, it does when you're doing science. That's what it means in that context. But for everyone else, it has this broader meaning. And I think something like that or something analogous to that is happening in the use of the term conspiracy theory between epistemologists on the one hand and um, the folk on the other. Yes, I was about to say it's a lot like the debate that people who teach critical thinking have all the time about when people say that's a really valid point you've got there, and the and the philosophy teacher goes, oh, "See what you're talking there is, is is soundness, and that refers to supremacy. Yeah. Validity is a, a and yes, there is this there is this worry, of course, in any kind of academic literature that sometimes when you're stipulating terms of the debate, you actually might be avoiding what the ordinary usage of that term happens to be. Mm. And of course, actually, this is a whole kettle of worms when it comes to conspiracy theory theory at the moment, which is when people in the Vulgate use the term conspiracy theory, there is a live question here as to whether they think it's got pejorative connotations. Mm. And there's also a live question as to when they're using that, they go, oh, you're dipping into a kind of narrative such as anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, New World Order conspiracy theories, and anti-vaccination conspiracy theories, which handily brings us on to what got you interested in conspiracy theories? Yes. So, I mean, I suppose I've always had some interest in the topic in a very abstract sort of way. Um, but, yeah, I, I um, found myself involved uh, in anti-anti-vaccination activism in Australia, uh, where there's been, we've been particularly successful actually in terms of combating anti-vaccine misinformation in Australia. Um, successful depending on which side of that particular um, argument you fall down on. But I found myself getting involved in that um, partly out of concern for the health issues associated with it, but also partly out of just a sort of generalised uh, peak about um, expertise denialism in general. Of course, I would say that I'm, you know, a salary intellectual. Of course, I'm going to be upset when people don't trust experts. Um, but uh, I, I got into that sort of stuff, and in talking to anti-vaxxers, and I'm using talking in a fairly generous sense here because really it's mostly just arguing with anti-vaxxers. Um, one thing that becomes very, very clear is that to sustain the anti-vax belief system or cluster of beliefs, I guess you might say you at some point have to appeal to, to conspiratorial explanations. So I think there's an important distinction between conspiracy theories that are born conspiratorial and the ones that become conspiratorial defensively. Vax, Anti-vaccine belief, I think, becomes conspiratorial defensively. How do you explain the fact that the entire medical and scientific community says vaccination is safe and effective if you are convinced that it's not? The only real way to do that is to... Actually, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can sort of do it with information cascades, but mostly the, the only real solution that works is to say that doctors and scientists and others know the truth, but they're actively working to cover it up. So that got me involved in that and got me thinking about some of these issues around how um, conspiracy theory works, how it propagates, um, and some of the really deep questions that go behind that about what motivates, if you like, conspiratorial versus anti-conspiratorial mindsets and that got me into the epistemological literature. So I actually started on this in sort of public activism stuff and then found my way into the academic literature, which um, then opened up onto this wonderful Australasian, or largely Australasian, sorry, Lee, um, literature that exists um, regarding uh, the epistemology of conspiracy theory. And that to me seems like a, a fairly complete literature in many ways. It actually has been a very progressive literature in terms of its answers some serious questions. Um, but what I want to do is then say, okay, how do we then plug that back into um, 
the environment in which we live, in which we do see conspiracy theories playing an increasingly large uh, part in um, contemporary events, or at least a more visible part in contemporary events, and sometimes um, it seems an actively harmful part too. So on a sidebar here, why do you think that in Australasia we've produced so many conspiracy theory theorists, particularly in philosophy? What is it about our unique climate where, because to be fair, I think politically both Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand are fairly benign policies compared to many northern hemisphere states you can think of. I mean, Australia demonstrably seems a lot worse than Aotearoa New Zealand politically at this particular point in time. But even then, the scandals you have, like the ScoMo Express, seem like fairly small scandals compared to what's going on in the White House at the moment. So why are we so interested in conspiracy theories, do you think? Uh, look, I'll, be, I'll preface this by saying I'm very sceptical of uh, why does this area produce so much of this, right? So, I mean, in, in Australia there was the... Um, question often raised is why do we produce so many materialist philosophers of mind? You know, why is it that that's a distinctive, um, distinctively Australian thing of, of reductive philosophy of mind? Um, you know, and there's a famous um, quip where somebody said to an Australian philosopher, it must be the heat, and he replied, well, it's not that hot out there. Um, but, I mean, if, if you absolutely said to me, speculate wildly on why this topic took root in Australasia, you possibly could tell a story in terms of colonial paranoia. Um, you could tell a story about if you, I, I won't claim to speak for um, New Zealand because I don't know the history well enough to do so. Um, like most Australians, I really only know in, in very broad brush strokes. But certainly in the Australian context, um, a lot of the colonial imaginary um, is bound up in um, fear of the Indigenous unknown, fear of being dragged into the Indigenous unknown, um, and a fear of what's going on just off beyond the edge of visibility in the bush. And, and I think maybe some of that potentially plays into the sense of being isolated at the whim of, of powerful actors we can't see. Slight, slight digression, actually. Um, I'm working on a little um, radio documentary at the moment uh, for um, the ABC, our national broadcaster here, on uh, a guy called Frederick Valentich, who was a pilot who vanished over Bass Strait 40 years ago after he reported a UFO flying on top of him, and he just completely vanished. And that then got me into an interesting literature around UFOs and on the idea that there is a kind of, again, post-colonial paranoia or that's, that's built into that, the fear of being abducted or dragged into the unknown um, and how that structures some of the ways in which we talk about things like alien abduction and so on. So, I mean, you don't want to overplay this stuff, but once you do get into that topic, there are some really interesting kind of resonances there to use Susan Lepselter's term. And does any of that play into the prevalence of anti-vaccination conspiracy theories in Australia, do you think? Maybe. I mean, I think that um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's more prevalent in Australia. It, it, it clusters. It clusters and it clusters in interesting ways that you can't necessarily predict. So some of the lowest vaccination areas in Australia are very wealthy areas where you've clearly got parents who, you know, I do my own research and they've gone out and done this stuff. But it also um, tends to cluster in places like the northern rivers of New South Wales, again, reasonably well-off area, but it's a very alternative area. So an area where I think a lot of people's epistemic stance is defined by I don't do what the mainstream does. Um, so I think that feeds into a lot of that. So there's a lot of different things that overlap. There's a lot of people that have... Um, commitments to a certain kind of alternative way of looking at things. They have certain ideas about the value of the natural over the artificial, however you want to parse those terms. Um, there's also a certain percentage of anti-vaxxers, I couldn't tell you what percentage, who just really hate doctors. And I don't use the word hate there hyperbolically, they hate them. Um, and uh, there's others for whom um, the entire... Uh, medical and um, governmental knowledge generating structures, if you like, of society are intrinsically not merely suspect but actually evil and that anything they say must be wrong and therefore they're fighting a kind of ongoing epistemic resistance, if you like. So there's, there's a whole bunch of overlapping reasons why people do become attracted to that. I actually will say, though, I think probably the vast majority of people who are sceptical of vaccines or who are uh, hesitant about vaccines, probably the vast majority are just parents who have read something and gotten scared which as a parent I completely understand, right? Everyone wants to do the best for their kids. They read something, they're not sure who to trust or where to go from there, uh, and on it goes. And one of the things we actually do in, in our activism in Australia is, that, okay, for those parents 
you need what they call a thousand cups of tea approach, right? Which is talk to them, get them to go to their GP, get them to have the chat about it, get them to find the information, help them out that way. When you've got the people who are actively um, spreading anti-vaccination stuff that they know or should know isn't true uh, and are making money doing so, that's a different kind of approach. That's where you start saying, okay, are these people breaching regulatory requirements? You know, how do we stop them from presenting themselves as something they're not to the media, for instance? And that's where you try and hold those people account. So there's different approaches and different kinds of activism involved here. Isn't that going to get us quite close to a conspiracy theory of anti-vaxxers, though? The idea that, well, if we just follow the money, then we've got a secretive plot here to somehow enrich and then just fill in the blanks. Um, I think to call that a conspiracy theory would be to credit them with a degree of organisation and secretiveness that they don't necessarily possess. Um, they're quite upfront about asking for money for things. They're quite upfront about trying to raise money and so on. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, but, I mean, um, in some ways I, I don't know that there's so much conspiratorial as... Um, just straightforwardly duplicitous, but they actually don't tend to play well with others. There's a lot of big egos in the um, anti-vaccination movement and very often um, they tend to clash when they feel like another anti-vax messiah is muscling in on their turf. Yes, it actually sounds a lot like what happens between the naturopaths and the homeopaths when they have competing products for the same malaise. And rather than being a complementary alternative medical system, they go, no, no, you can't trust the homeopath slash naturopath, depending on who you're ta talking to, because they're the one who's full of bunk. But my particular home cure is the correct one. And so, yes, I do think you do get particularly in groups which feel marginalised or are actually being marginalised, a kind of, I don't, know, I don't know whether preciousness is the right way to put it, a kind of defensiveness about you don't understand me, which makes you sound about you're not my mum style <laughs> argumentation. But I yeah. suppose for the person who is worried about anti-vaccines and has Sorry, about vaccines, or not, not about anti-vaccines. We haven't got to the to actually prescribing anti-vaccines yet. When vaccines get bad, we have to put the anti-vaccines in. For people who are worried about vaccines, there is, of course, unfortunately, but particularly for epistemologists, the history of medical misadventure in the 20th century. Yeah. And thus there is a kind of evidentiary basis here, which is, well, in the 20th century, doctors did things and they didn't inform people about it and they lied about it after the fact. So why would we trust these experts now, given their history of duplicity in the past? Sure. Um, and it's a valid question, and, and this tends to come up a lot. So um, we talk to people and say, oh, well, what about, you know, thalidomide or, you know, doctors used to endorse smoking or whatever. Um, the interesting question there is that, to say, well, I'm not saying, and I don't think anyone would or should ever say that medicine is somehow infallible. Um, rather, the question is just what, yeah, it, what else are you going to actually um, take as a source of knowledge here? Given that we're talking about um, existential sort of questions, right? You can't ignore your health, right? You can't just sort of, it, it's that Pascal thing where Pascal says, you know, the sensible thing would be not to choose to believe in God or not believe in God, but you don't have that luxury because you're already embarked, you're already underway. Um, in the same sort of way, you can't, you can't existentially ignore questions of your health, so you need to find out answers to some of these questions. Um, what are the available sources of knowledge? Well, there's medicine, which is far from perfect and certainly nowhere near complete, um, assuming any science could ever be complete. Um, you might think, well, that's not great, but it's the best going relative to all the other um, possibilities in terms of its evidentiary base and so on. So, you know, a lot of the time what we say to people when they say, oh, but surely, you know, medicine's not perfect. It's like, no, no one says it is. Um, you could paraphrase Winston Churchill and say it's the worst available health epistemology except for all the other health epistemologies. So, but, you know, uh, but again, there is a, a kind of a practical, um, I would say, existential stance, if you like, behind that of saying, well, you have to sort of, get your information from somewhere. And that's where it also then becomes problematic. So a lot of people then say, oh, well, that's okay. I'll fall back on my common sense. And I'm increasingly sceptical there is any such thing. I'm increasingly of the mind there's just 
good reasoning and bad reasoning um, and that we we go wrong when we reify these things into common sense or reason and, and treat them as you know, faculties that we all have that allow us to disagree with anyone we like on any topic. My in my intuition tells me you're correct about that. Good. Well, that's okay. Good. I'll take that as a, as a <laughs> yes. But yes, oh, yeah. There is this there is this kind of issue here with a who are the experts? B do I agree with the experts? And C if I disagree with the experts, am I disagreeing with them because I've got a principled reason for disagreeing with them, mm. or because my gut reckons, my intuitions tell me that what they're saying must be wrong? Sure. And Which often it's. Yeah. Doesn't mean those intuitions can be, uh, you know, necessarily aren't wrong. I mean, sometimes you will notice that something's off or something's wrong or something doesn't sound right. Um, it's the certainty with which people um, immediately infer from that to, therefore, I must be right and this person must be completely wrong. Um, or, you know, this thing here sounds right to me, therefore, this larger thing must be wrong. That's what kind of worries me. You see in climate denial quite often, you see people say things like, well, um, my understanding here of high school math says that the world should be this, or high school physics says the world should be this way. A climate scientist is telling me it's that way. Um, but my high school physics can't be wrong, therefore, they must all be wrong or lying. Um, it's understandable in a way why people do that and why that's such a powerful move but it also lacks the ability to say oh hang on maybe i just don't get it or maybe my immediate kind of gut response is not completely reliable Yes, and that also gets us into the awkwardness of expertise, because as we see in the world, there are lots of people who are expert in X or expert in Y who suddenly decide that they are going to be experts in Z and X as well. Yeah. And thus you have these situations where people who think, well, I'm clever about this thing, I must be clever about all things. Yeah. And unfortunately, we live in a kind of epistemically constituated world now, where having expertise in one special in one specialization isn't necessarily transferable to other specializations. I know an awful lot about epistemology, but you wouldn't want me to set the course to Mars. Hmm. Sure. No, or me either. And again, that is a risk that happens. And um, there's an interesting tension there between the the role of the, the public intellectual, which is I think in some ways a legitimate role, but it does require people to stray out of their lanes a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, but there is also this thing that needs to be avoided of this sort of, you know, universal genius idea. That if you're particularly good at one thing, therefore, as you say, you must be particularly good at or expert at a whole bunch of other things. And it doesn't necessarily work. And, um, you know, we see that sometimes with some Nobel winners who suddenly go off on frolics late in their career or, or whatever, or um, get into totally other areas in which they're not qualified to speak on. And yeah, intellectual humility is a good thing. I'll, so I'll, talking I'll about intellectual humility you have not one but two chapters in a book recently published called taking conspiracy theories which is edited by one m r x dentist uh, there we go uh, how did you get involved in that uh the editor in question asked me to uh so um part of it came out of um a workshop that we had in melbourne which you attended a couple of years ago and some of my ideas sort of came together in that uh, which then turned into one paper but kind of then split in two, which I, I don't know if this is your experience. I find my papers reproduce the same way amoebas do. They just sort of hive off into separate papers. Um, arguably, I've been writing the one paper since, since grad school. Um, but, and it's immortal, which is distressing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so from that, uh, you, you asked if I could... Um, submit a couple of these chapters to the book, um, which also as well came out of that um, discussion between you, me, and, and Lee Basham uh, that took place in the pages of Social Epistemology Review and Reply Collective, which um, uh, I actually had the, the chance to say to Steve Fuller a little while ago was is a fantastic thing that that journal is doing with, um, with Cirque and um, I think in many ways uh, provides a model for what post-publication um, review or post-publication refereeing will look like. Um, in future. Uh, and that was a really productive discussion and really good to sort of get into and ventilate uh, some of those ideas. Tricky discussion to get into because, of course, you and Lee were basically agreeing with one another. And so what I had to do then was to try and sort of somehow, using that agreement, find a way to sort of find a space to disagree. And, to, and in doing so, that was really useful for sort of finessing um, 
my own sort of view on the debate between generalism and particularism, uh, which I then still haven't quite settled to my satisfaction yet, but I've, I feel like I've made progress. But those chapters are also a way too of looking at some of the intersections, if you like, between the epistemic and the ethical dimensions of conspiracy theory as a practice. So when we engage in conspiracy theorising, um, what are the ethical implications of what we are actually doing, given that theorising is an activity and as such has a, a, an ethically valuable dimension to it? Now, you've mentioned two terms here, generalism and particularism. Would you care to expound on what generalism and particularism are in order that we can then discuss about your 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 third way? Right. So taking my cues from uh, Dentith, um, I would say that... So, so we talk about you know, particularism and generalism as, I, I guess you could say, two answers to the question, when can we dismiss a theory out of hand purely because it is a conspiracy theory, using the word theory in a way that no scientist will countenance, but leave that aside. Um, in a way, the generalist says all the time, the particularist says never. Uh, there'll almost immediately be caveats to that, at least on the generalist side, because, of course, you can say, what, so Watergate didn't happen? Or it was just an accident? Everyone just accidentally acted in a way that looked like conspiracy? Oh, OK, yeah, sure, then. In which case, and that's why, and I think you and others have demonstrated pretty clearly that Naive generalism, if we can call it that, isn't going to function. Um, but that Basham, and, and it, for instance, has said, well, that then takes us to particularism and says, let's just go full particularist. That is, investigate every single um, conspiracy theory on its merits. Now, what I want to suggest is that for as, just as for the generalist, there are going to be occasions when, in fact, um, you should entertain a conspiracy theory. For the particularist, there may well be occasions where, in fact, you shouldn't entertain a conspiracy theory, where entertain here means investigate it long enough to, to actually be taking it seriously. So what I want to suggest is that there are certain classes of, um, well, firstly, there are certain classes of conspiracy theory where we might actually say, oh, wait a minute, that's anti-Semitic, I'm not even going to, to engage in it because doing so is part of taking part in a recognisable practice, which is a, a bad one. Um, but there's also the broader point that you really can't articulate a conspiracy theory or form a conspiracy theory without accusing someone of something. And I claim, and this is a bit sort of deontological and, and a lot of people may start to disagree, um, that there is always a kind of moral cost in accusation, that there's always to accuse someone is to automatically not think well of them to some extent and that I think violates a default property uh, presumption we have against people. I think that means that we should always be at least a little bit reluctant to accuse someone of something, and that seems to entail that we should always be, uh, or at least we have a defeasible reason to be suspicious of conspiracy explanations. Um, but that also has to leave open the fact that at some point conspiracy explanations become unavoidable. At some point it just becomes absolutely clear that, that that's what's going on. Now, you call this position reluctant particularism, mm. which indicates that you're at least hedging your bets with the particulars to a large extent, mm. but you're kind of saying, slow down, slow down. Let's not just ask any old question. Let's consider the boundaries of what those questions should look like. Yeah. So my question for you is, who does get to ask those questions? I mean, yeah. we live in a world where the police are allowed to make very serious accusations about what people do, yeah. often with good reason. Uh, politicians are allowed to make accusations about their opponents, often with no good reason whatsoever. So there are a whole bunch of licenses we have in social life which allow certain people to engage in making those accusations. Sure. And the world hasn't fallen apart. Well, maybe, pol maybe politically the world has fa fallen apart, but on a law and order aspect, that seems to kind of work. Mm. Well, here I'd want to be very careful that we are clear what we mean by allowed to. Um, <clears throat> certainly we do allow and encourage the police, for instance, to, you know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to make accusations or to, uh, you know, to follow their suspicions out, if that makes sense. Um, even then there's, there's limits to it, right? At some point it might become harassment or at some point it becomes a misuse of resources or what have you. Um, on the other hand, though, you, you may raise the case of politicians, right? Now, 
you might say, well, that's the rough and tumble of politics um, to make accusations. But I would actually want to say that no, politicians probably shouldn't, and that's a moral shouldn't, not necessarily a political shouldn't, um, uh, be making accusations that they can't stand up or for which they don't have really strong grounds to, to, uh, to make that stick, if you like. Um, so, yeah, we, but having said that, yeah, as I say, maybe what that actually demonstrates in a way is that the role of suspicion is something that we take to be properly circumscribed. Um, and built into the background of this is a somewhat, uh, I guess, a, a view of moral life which owes something, I think, to um, K. Lustrup, who's become one of my more recent kind of touchstones in moral philosophy, according to which... Um, human life is fundamentally or by default about trust or is fundamentally, you know, depends upon a certain kind of trust that people have such that things like suspicion or mistrust need to be, uh, if not rare, then at least not the norm or at least not the default way of, of approaching other people. Um, that's under normal conditions, of course. Lustrup was involved in the Danish resistance and he wrote about how there are conditions of wartime in which all that stuff goes out the window. But what you're trying to do is actually get everything back to a society in which trust is the sort of normal default in which people operate. But I will just say too, because I had this discussion the other day actually with David Cody when he was in Melbourne, um, and I said something about trust being a virtue, and he's like, no, absolutely not, trust is not a virtue, or at least not an epistemic virtue. It might be on a family level or something like that, but not at the level of citizens to the state. And on one level I want to disagree with that, on the other level I have to agree, there is just a stand in tension between um, default trust as a kind of basic ethical orientation towards other people and the sort of standing suspicion of power that any healthy polity needs in order to function properly. There just is a tension there. Um, and this is the, the continental philosophy in my training coming out that, uh, you know, we just live with tension sometimes. They're just there. Yes, because I was, I was going to say, surely any conspiracy theorist with their salt will go, well, maybe trust is an ideal thing to have, but look at what people actually do. People sure. lie, cheat, and steal all the time. Mm. So surely we should be well, very, very suspicious. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here as a devil's advocate here. Yeah. I'm not saying I am the conspiracy theorist, sure. but given, given the history of collusion in mm. politics, uh, corporations doing what they do, criminal fraternities and, and the like, mm. a default trust in others does seem somewhat naive. Sure. Um, a lot is going to hang on what we mean by all the time, which is a phrase you use there. Um, and I think some of this does come down to ultimately unfalsifiable positions. Um, and you've written about this too, that there's, there's no way of falsifying um, any claim about how conspired the world really is, um, except the one that says it's not conspired at all. You can falsify that because you can show conspiracies. Um, but how falsified it is, or sorry, how conspired it is, um, I think fundamentally does come down to these very basic background assumptions that people have. And there may be no way of settling that. There may be no rational way of adjudicating between somebody who wants to say that the world is full of conspiracy that's always beyond detection versus somebody who wants to say the world is basically unconspired and conspiracies when they happen are small, local, short-lived um, and not particularly effective. So some of this stuff I think does come down to very basic background assumptions that may just be beyond the reach of argument on some level. Yes, I mean, as you know, my position on this is that we don't live in a totally conspired world, but we do live in a more conspired world than people probably think, just because people downplay ordinary commonplace conspiracy and kind of ignore that in their calculations. So, yes, I mean, there is this, you're right, when we say all the time, or I should say when the conspiracy theorist says all the time, there is an awful lot riding on, well, you don't literally mean all the time. Otherwise, you'd never have any trust in anything that's going on around you. What you're saying is something more along the lines of these things happen more often than people think or more often than not, which so, I think that latter claim is hard to support. I mean, there's also a question there about how much intentionality or agency to you impute to things. Um, I mean, there are a lot of things that look conspiratorial um, that maybe just aren't. I mean, so, I mean, I know um, David Cody's written about quasi-conspiracy theory as a category, that, that sometimes there are things that look 
like collusion, but that aren't actually collusion. So all the petrol stations put their price of petrol up at the same time or down at the same time. But that doesn't mean they're meeting in a smoke-filled room somewhere and saying, ah, it's going to be 140 cents a litre this week. Um, it just means they're watching what everyone else does and they know rationally how everyone should act in concert to bring about the best outcome. You know, if um, uh, you arrest a, a criminal gang and you interrogate all of them separately and none of them say anything, is that a conspiracy of science, silence or is that just that they just know if no one talks, each of them will get a better outcome? If many cr criminals turn out to be very good at game theory. <laughs> yeah, this is true. That's why there are no prisoners. Yes. Oh, if, and actually, if only they really were the prisoner dilemma. We have no prisoners. This is this is an absolute dilemma. We keep on building prisons. We don't put anyone in them. But that's a social justice thing for a, another time. So, yeah, so you talk about reluctant particularism as a species of particularism. Of mm. course, someone who's worried about the kind of discourse you're engaging in will go, but surely what you're describing here is just a species of generalism and that you're you're doing the the nod to conspiracies occur but you also seem to be saying but we shouldn't really look at those conspiracies because you know if we do we're accusing people of things and that's breaking down trust and many of these conspiracy theories do look an awful lot like other ones we already consider to be bunk so we should just push those things to one side and continue mm -hmm. on happily in our lives how do you respond to that kind of construal of your position Sure. Um, it's not an entirely uncharitable one. Um, I, I guess what I would say is that I, I've called, I can say it's a species of particularism, but in a way it's trying to resist particularism in the same sort of way it resists generalism. That is by saying that um, there is not going to be a blanket approach, right? There's not going to be blanket dismissal is not going to work. We all agree that. But at the same time, I want to say that blanket take seriously is also not going to work. Um, so the question then is under what conditions does it not work? Now, you could say that uh, there are, that you can dismiss a conspiracy theory out of hand only under a very, very narrow set of um, conditions. Say, say it involves physical impossibility or it involves you know, logical contradiction, um, you know, Elvis is alive and he was killed by the mafia. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, oh, you know, JFK is alive, but he was killed by the CIA, whatever. Um, but at the same time, I would want to go broader than that um, to something like a position that says that innocent or at least disorganised explanations um, are, have a sort of presupposition until they stop being progressive explanations and the conspiratorial explanations sort of takes over, if you like. Now, I will admit there's a problem there, which is that, well, surely you have to pursue the conspiratorial explanation for it to get to that point, and that's a valid sort of point. Um, again, part of it maybe comes down to where, who is actually doing the judging here, and this comes back to a question you raised earlier. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, um, the conspiracy theorist is you know, perhaps in a way not acting terribly virtuously, but in so doing, perhaps they do uncover genuine conspiracies. I'm not sure how often that actually happens. Uh, in the same sort of way as the police do uncover um, crimes by being more suspicious than the rest of us should be, the rest of us looking on perhaps shouldn't rush to judgment about, you know, who committed a particular crime or whether something's the outcome of a conspiracy. Um, but equally, of course, you can't go too far the other way. We've just seen that today with, with Donald Trump, you know, sort of saying, you know, washing his hands of, um, you know, making a decision as to whether or not the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia murdered a journalist in the Saudi embassy in Turkey. Um, again, that would seem to be a point where that position um, has gone awry of simply, you know, at, at some point it's no longer feasible to suspend judgment. Especially since Donald Trump's press release seems to spend an awful lot of time bl blaming Iran for things before it even gets around to actually making any claims about Mohammed mm. bin Salman. But that's a different matter for a different time. American politics could keep us going for weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm. So what do you think the future for philosophical research into conspiracy theories looks like? Because you describe the fact that as a project in epistemology, it's A, being quite successful in saying, look, if we define these things as theories about conspiracies, 
then we do have to follow some kind of particular evidentialist approach. Mm. And we've been fairly good at looking at issues and knocking them on, on their head. So is there more to do? Sure. I mean, as I say, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in the, in the ethics of conspiracy theories. A lot, of be, lot to be done. Some of this will just start to depart from philosophy too, right? So, I mean, there's still a lot to be done in terms of um, the sociology and, and the political uses and, of conspiracy theory. Um, but I also think that a really productive discussion and probably a really dis productive disagreement to have in that space does concern the proper nature of trust. So I've sort of just mentioned or gestured really towards a kind of the Strippian view of trust as this um, foundational default thing. As he says somewhere, trust is primary, distrust secondary. Very different to say um, David Cody's Aristotelian account of trust according to which you should um, have the right balance between, you know, the vices of credulousness and, and um, irascible suspicion. Somewhere in the middle is the, the virtuous mean. Um, I, I think connecting conspiracy theory to some of those questions will be a really, really important one. Um, I think there's also some interesting work to be done in terms of the connection between social epistemology and epistemological temperaments, if you like, the different ways in which people assume knowledge to work. That's something I've seen uh, arguing with some of the more Baroque anti-vaxxers is that um, they have this kind of foundationalist conception of how epistemology works, right? They assume that there are hard bedrock facts that can be ascertained. And once we have those hard bedrock facts, everything's fine. And if there's something wrong further back in the chain of reasoning, that means the whole edifice of say modern immunology falls down. So, if, you know, um, cautious postulates are wrong, then the whole system collapses or whatever. Um, or if Pasteur made a mistake, therefore germ theory is bunk. And of course, it's not necessarily how knowledge works, but there's an interesting debate I think to be had there about um, the sort of foundationalist expectations that some people have about knowledge versus uh, the far more kind of almost free floating account of how knowledge generation and knowledge validation works happens that we're getting now from social epistemologists. I think there's a, an interesting discussion to be had there, which then connects with the political discussion too, right? About, um, you know, do a lot of these explanations or a lot of these, these understandings of the world take root because people are in fact politically disconnected from or disenfranchised from or alienated from the knowledge generating mechanisms of society? And what do we do about that? Yes, and actually that makes me think of the work of David Lewis here and the notion of webs of belief, which was his kind of almost quasi-coherence theory of truth when it comes to scientific beliefs or at least the theoretical postulates, whereby your hardcore are those beliefs which are really, really well connected to other beliefs in your mm. system. And over time, those beliefs will shift. And possibly what was a really hardcore 20 years ago will turn out to be on the periphery or just completely rejected at some particular point. And I think there's an interesting tension here in a kind of global sense when we talk about conspiracies and conspiracy theories. Because in certain nation states, which have a long history of conspiracy being the norm, uh, so Latvia, for example, and Romania are both examples of governments which were communist, were conspiring against their population, had two markets, one for the communists, one for the non-communists. It seems reasonable for Latvians and Romanians post the communist revolution to go, well, technically we changed the type of government, but the same people actually stayed in charge. So they just changed their face, but they still conspired in the background. Whilst Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand being long-standing democracies, New Zealand in particular being such a small country that we literally all know the prime minister and have been to a gig she's DJed at at some particular point in time. We know that there are, you know, there are small scale conspiracies going on in politics all the time, but nothing major because if that was going on, then my aunt would know about it and she would tell me or something of that particular type. Mm. And I think that might also explain a really interesting factor about when you talk about conspiracies and conspiracy theories, you get different reactions at different times and places, which indicate that the theoretical constructs people are using to assume the existence or non-existence of conspiracies are very socially con uh, constituted. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And again, there's 
there's a lot more work for, for sociology to do here. I, mean, I know there's already been a lot of activity in sociology on this, um, which seems to be a common pattern, actually, that the philosophers are last in on a lot of this stuff. I mean, um, like I, I work on one of the issues I work on is the, the ethical and ontological status of the dead in social media environments in, in the internet. Um, and again, sociologists have already kind of been through and cleared that out, as have and, and various other cultural theorists and others and philosophers are just now going, oh, hang on, there's some stuff here. Um, but yeah, th this is actually something where I think philosophy needs to get a lot better actually is at um, dealing with a lot of those socio-political contingencies and the way in which those do feed into our epistemology and, and we do i think very often work with an idealized noah um which is not a knower not not an idealized guy with an arc um that you know doesn't really match the way in which even philosophers ourselves know things in the world um just on words of belief too as you mentioned too um, there's also an interesting um analogy in uh wittgenstein in uncertainty where he talks about the difference between the river and the riverbed the river's always moving, but the riverbed is kind of stable and not amenable to revision, if you like, except that sometimes it is because over time the water will move bits of the riverbed out of the way. So, again, there's maybe a more dynamic relationship between these sort of, you know, fundamental beliefs or foundational beliefs and the, the stuff that we change around or the stuff that's in play than we might accept, but, it, but over a very long alluvial sort of time scale. Yes, and I think, I think you're right to say that, well, to suggest that maybe – Part of the future is we need to be doing a lot more in the way of interdisciplinary work so that we're not siloing ourselves mm -hmm. into our own particular little disciplines, which yeah. of course has meant, as I've discovered by doing work on conspiracy theory theory, often we are reinventing positions that people in other disciplines have already put forward, sure. or people in other dis d disciplines are reinventing our positions mm. 10 years later without being aware of the criticisms of those positions that occurred in the last 10 years. Yeah. Or the third thing that can happen is we come in and um, suggest that a, a system that seems to be working quite well, that's well functional, it's actually, you know, producing good outcomes. Um, it has some kind of conceptual incoherence in it, which means the whole thing clearly doesn't work at all. Until um, we throw it away. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the whole, you know, that, that's all well and good in practice, but will it work in theory uh, reflex, which, um, you know, doesn't make us popular. Um, and actually, it, it, I will say, and, and your work is uh, certainly an exception to this, and there are many others, but in general, I think philosophers are not great at interdisciplinary work. Um, I think that's more to do with the sociology of philosophy than anything. It's more to do with the way philosophers are socialised to go about their task. Um, where it does work well, I think it works really well, um, but there are also plenty of occasions where if you try and force interdisciplinarity with a philosopher, um, you just end up annoying everyone involved. So it's that's something philosophers need to get better at. So yes, yeah, so I remember yeah. having a conversation years ago with an epistemologist talking about how people acquire beliefs and spread beliefs, and he was putting forward a kind of foundationalist, plantiger-style way. And I was going, but that's not how people actually generate beliefs. Why are you saying that? Well, because psychologists study how beliefs get generated and spread. Oh, well, the psychologist must be wrong, he said, because, you know, the theory works really well. Okay, so, yeah, the theory might look good on paper, but if that's not how people do things, that's yeah. not how people do things. Well, it's, I mean, that's something that's coming up too increasingly these days is um, – Academics in general, but I think philosophers in particular, are wedded to a certain understanding of how reasoning works, according to which we just, you know, calmly and dispassionately evaluate all the facts before us and then we make a rationally guided decision. Um, and it's increasingly clear that most discourse doesn't actually work like that. That's increasingly being challenged by empirical understandings of the way decision-making processes work, um, even neurobiological accounts of how that works. And that is something that philosophers... Uh, I think in particular need to actually engage with is um, that gap between our sort of idealized conception of, of how critical thinking or reasoning works and, or judgment formation works or belief formation works um, and what we're being told by the empirical sciences. Um, what do we do about that gap? How do we address it? And does that then lead us on into much bigger gaps between, you know, phenomenology and neuroscience, for instance, and how do we deal with those those tensions. Which, which does suggest there's a lot more work to be done. Yeah, absolutely.
Well, thank you, Pat. That has been a most informative chat, and I'm rather looking forward to you getting your copy of the book to see what the responses are and how you deal with mm. the replies to your position. Yes, I'm not looking forward to some of that. I um, saw something that would indicate that um, Charles Pigden in particular probably is going to let me have it with both barrels. Um, but um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm, 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 I'm kind of happy enough to play the villain in that um, in that volume just insofar as it probably needed a villain of some sort to sort of get some, to motivate some some debate there so um, yeah it's all right we're going to bring you to the dark side eventually <laughs> but no thank you very much this has been a most informative chat absolute pleasure thank you very much indeed well wasn't that fun thanks once again to pat for letting me ask him questions for almost an hour and thanks to the various internet gods which allowed us to troubleshoot our way to that interview. As usual, if you like this kind of content and want to see more of it, why not pay my Patreon a visit? And remember to like and subscribe. But until next time, be seeing you.